think that the disciples didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. It even says so in the scripture. And this is one of those passages that some of you have probably heard a lot of sermons on. Because this whole business about sheep and shepherds and whatever, it's all through the New Testament. But I just want to remind you of where it all came from. I want to read Psalm 23, and if you know it, feel free to say it along with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want it. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That song, which is hard to read because I know it a different way than the translation, <laughs> that song has gotten a lot of people through a lot of misery. It is the single most requested piece of scripture, even before John 3.16. It is the thing we hold on to when we really don't know where things are going. And I want to use that to help us understand what on earth Jesus was talking about with this business about, oh, he's the sheepfold, he's the shepherd, he's the gate, he's all of these things simultaneously, and also reflect a little bit on the issue of whose voice do we hear here in the sheepfold. Now, there are people who really object to being called sheep. They just think, you know, I'm not a liberal, rational Protestant for nothing, and I don't want to be a sheep. But I think all of us have had times in our lives when we felt as though the thing we wanted the most was just to know which way to go. There's so many times in our lives when we don't want to have to leave. We don't want to have to reinvent ourselves. We don't want to have to think outside the box. Please, for heaven's sake, just tell me where I need to go. Some of you may have had that at the doctor's office. It's like they give you all these possibilities and then you're supposed to choose. <laughs> Dude, you're the one with the degree. <laughs> you need a little help here. <laughs> or you're sitting down and trying to make arrangements for elderly family members. And they say, well, you could do this. You could have this kind of a trust or that kind of a trust. Or you could do. And, and you find yourself thinking, really? Can I make this choice? Do I know how to make this choice? There are just so many times when we really kind of need to be the sheep. When we need the comfort of being with a whole lot of people that are like us. When we need someone to guide us. The question is, the question is, who will that person be? There are a lot of people, I think, in the United States who are looking for guidance. They think that somehow the country's gotten off in the wrong direction, and they want it to change, and they want to follow somebody. <coughs> what worries me is who they're following. You know? No, I can't say that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now I can say anything you want, right? You don't have to worry about endangering your 5013C status after. 30 years of protecting it for our churches. Okay. But anyway. No, the issue is that it's hard to figure out where to go next or what to do next. 
because the way is by no means clear. You know, 20 years ago, when the economy had some kind of a correction, that polite word we use when people lose their jobs and nobody has any money, we all kind of knew what to do. I mean, it was clear. The economists could say, well, do this and do that, and you would get to another good place. But that's not clear anymore. Things have profoundly changed in our world. The fact that industries that used to pay really good wages don't always anymore, that frightens people. And I can understand how terrifying it must be to have invested 30 or 40 years of your life in a particular industry, in a particular job, only to find out that it no longer exists. More about that later. So people are looking for someone who will lead them out of this mess, who will make things better again. But we should be careful what we wish for. Because the temptation is to look for the strongest person in the room. Let's look for the person who fits our idea of leader. And let's follow them. Jesus is speaking directly to this issue. He starts out with saying, those who climb into the sheepfold, in other words, those who sneak in, are thieves and bandits. In his own time, Jesus struggled with the fact that his own people, the Israelite population, was divided was seeking some way to get free of the Romans. They had all kinds of self-appointed leaders, gurus who would lead them to the right place. And Jesus was trying to warn his followers not to get scammed. If somebody climbs in the back door, don't be surprised that they're not out to help you. So how then are we supposed to figure out who came in the back door and who came in the front door? That's where the issue of listening comes in. I belong to this uh, Facebook group called Pantsuit Nation. Yeah, some of you belong to this. It's a closed group. I don't know why it's closed, frankly, but it is. And it's basically people just telling their stories. So every few days, there's a picture of some young, some young woman who's the first in her family to graduate, and you know she's got a graduation robe on, and or someone who's worked three jobs and is finally able to get their kids through school, someone who came here five years ago as an immigrant and is now able to do something wonderful for our society. They're mostly pretty happy stories, and the stories are why I like it. Not even for the political point of view, which I do kind of like, but more importantly, I get to hear more stories. People telling from their own experience what works. We've kind of lost that in this country. I think we've even lost it in, in church. We don't have time somehow to tell those stories. Now, in some traditions, people testify during worship. This is how I got over. This is how I got over whatever it was. This is how I got from a life that was misery to a life that's blessed by God. There's a lot of storytelling. But in the United Church of Christ, we kind of struggle with that. But there's, there's so many other things we do. But those stories are crucial. Because you really can't evaluate whether someone has snuck into that sheepfold by the back door or come in through the front door until you hear their story. Until you know who they are at their really deep level. Not just the face we put on for everybody, but that level where you know and you can discern truth. So one of the ways to figure out 
whose voice you should be listening to is whose story do you know? Now the temptation for us is to only listen to stories that fit with ours. So people from the same you know, ethnic group, people from the same part of the country, people whose lives look like ours, their stories are easy to hear. It's harder to hear the stories of those whose lives are very, very different. I was reading the other day the work of a Lutheran pastor. And his ministry is right on the border. He, he has a church somewhere in South Texas. And most of his members are Spanish speaking first. Uh, many of them are immigrants. And most of them work at reasonably low-wage jobs. And he told his synod, their conference, that he wouldn't be coming to this year's annual meeting because he just couldn't drag his folks through the cultural experience of being discounted. He said, we go to these meetings, and all they talk about is our German heritage. Remember, they're Lutherans. From the UCC, read Yankees. <laughs> All they do is talk about who we are, as though somehow the members of his church are not part of the Lutheran body. And he said, I just can't drag them through it again, because after all, they struggle enough they struggle enough just to show up to church on Sunday, to get the time off from work, to find enough money to put in the plate, to keep the church going. They don't need to be oppressed by their own church. That was a really hard thing for me to hear. Because as somebody who's vested in the church and who works for the conference, we like to believe that, of course, we welcome everybody. <coughs> and everybody's treated equally. But I was reminded that it's not just the Lutherans, that it is also us in the United Church of Christ, that we sometimes act as though we were all the same, that everybody looked like me, that everybody had a background that was English first, that everybody came from a big church where there was a Sunday school with 15 classes. So we need to be careful whose stories we listen to. There are probably some we need to hear that we're not hearing. But once we hear those stories, once within the sheepfold we really get to know each other, it does make many things much simpler. It becomes clear who is listening and who is just there for their own needs? Who is really going to be able to lead and who is just there for a payday? Now sometimes we're tempted to believe within the United States and certainly within the church that the person <coughs> whose need is the greatest, must always be telling the truth. That's not really so. Neither is it true that the person who is the most religious, the most pious, who says the name of Jesus enough times, that that person must certainly be telling the truth. That's not always true either. And see, you don't really know those things until you get to know a person and you hear their story, and you come to understand who they are. So the question of holding people in community, of in the sheepfold where we're looking for leadership, listening to one another, and trying to discern who should we follow? I said I would get back to where the church is. 
This may not, not be apparent to all of you because you guys are in a happy, healthy church. But most folks in mainline Protestant churches are watching everything they worked for fall apart. And I have to say that as someone who's been invested in the church my whole adult life, I kind of feel that way too. There are less than half the number of pastoral jobs open that there were five years ago. There are churches closing every single day. And it's easy to look for someone to fix that. We would love for somebody to just come to the Florida conference and say, do this and all of your churches will thrive. And believe me, there's no shortage of people who'd like to be paid to do that. Oh yeah. There are all kinds of church consultants and people, you know, companies that will come, we can raise your attendance in 30 days. It's so tempting. It's just like when you're at the doctor or at the lawyer or someplace where you feel really insecure. You want someone to come fix it. But I know there is no fix. There is only moving forward faithfully, listening to people listening to their stories, trying to discern who should we trust to lead us forward. Now, as I say, you guys are a happy, healthy church. You're not worried about going out of business today, tomorrow, or the next day. But you are also a church that is right at the point <coughs> where the decisions you make matter. Because you're right at the perfect size to be able to thrive, to be out of the, you know, you're not a new church anymore. Now you're an established church. But the decisions you make as a church will determine your happiness, your healthiness, your faithfulness to God in the next few years. You know, in the United Church of Christ, we always say, you are free to be whoever God calls you to be. Local churches are free to do whatever God calls them to do. I add to that, and we're free to make a lot of really stupid mistakes. <laughs> One of the things I've learned at being at the conference, because the stories I hear are stories mostly of churches, is that churches do a lot of kind of stupid things. <laughs> They allow themselves to be led out of the sheepfold by somebody who promises them, I'll make you a big megachurch. Or they're led out by people who say things like, well, if you just use my five-step program, you will never have to worry about money again. Oh, that's an elusive one. That's hard, huh? The temptation to never worry about money again. But the fact is, your strength is you. Your strength is that Jesus is here among you and that Jesus will lead you and guide you as much as you allow. If you find yourself putting other people's opinions first, it might be hard to follow Jesus. The fact is, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves this church. And Jesus wants you all to be so bonded together that you can hear his voice leading you. Not the voices of people from the outside that tell you that you're not a real church. People who tell you that if you just follow their program, you never have money problems again. People that tell you that somehow you're not right. But the voice of Jesus, the one who says, I love you. I am willing to give up my life for the sake of my flock. That Jesus who must have known Psalm 23 so well 
that it informed his whole ministry. That was the metaphor that he used. You have a lot of choices to make. Just every day, you know, churches are making choices all the time. Listen to one another. Listen to the voice of the one who loves you. And believe that the one who loves you will guide you and guard you and lead you where you need to go. Amen. Amen. Amen.